Mariella, you're on mute. Hello. <laughs> Good morning or afternoon or evening to all of you. We are here today for the last episode of the BAI and ECDPM series on connecting public and private responses to COVID and its impact on global development. Today, we will close in style, looking at what solutions we have on offer to give an adequate response to COVID-19, but also to guarantee better healthcare in the future. In the previous webinars, we talked about the role of enterprises for economic resilience and sustainable development, digitalization and developing countries' economies, and financing the response to COVID-19. DAI is a global company with 50 years of experience in implementing development aid in challenging environments and a long-term presence in more than 100 countries. ECDPM, the European Centre for Development Policy Management, is an independent research organisation that wants to make policies work in Europe and Africa. What brings us together is the commitment to inclusive and sustainable development. I am Mariella Di Ciomo from the European Centre for Development Policy Management, where I work on European External Affairs, and I have the honour or will be of moderating these sessions today. I will also take questions at the middle, at the, at the end of the webinar, so please leave them in the QA box and I will do my best to take as many questions as I can. The pandemic has brought back global health on the agenda not only of ministries of health, but of prime ministers and business leaders. Yet the political space for the international cooperation is narrow and needs to be fought mile by mile. But beyond the scenes and the diplomatic spots, there is a lot of cooperation going on. I'm talking, for example, about scientists, pharmaceutical companies, healthcare staff, international organizations, governments, and even volunteers that across countries are working relentlessly to give us a vaccine against the coronavirus. One concrete example of collaboration is the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator that works to ensure that access to health technologies against the virus is equitable and prioritizes vulnerable people, regardless of where they are and their ability to pay. We need cooperation to address the coronavirus crisis, but also future pandemics, and hopefully leave a legacy of better healthcare services overall. We need to ensure that the crisis measures don't distract from delivering essential health services, for example, to the detriment of women. There is no panel worth of this name today without our magic word of the times digital. The crisis has exposed even more our dependence on data, connectivity, and technology. This is not only to respond to the pandemic, but also to carry on with some degree of normality our daily lives during the lockdown. How are data collected and used to fight the coronavirus? How do we work in environments where technology is not optimal, and how do we reach people in need through technology better than we would do without it? There are so many issues at stake, and I have just mentioned them. We will go deeper into these topics today with our excellent speakers. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope you will enjoy the discussion. And I'm now leaving the floor to Mar Martinez, from the European Commission. She is a policy officer at DEFCO and she works on health policy and programs. So Mark, uh, the floor is yours and I think you will talk to us about the global scenarios for health, global health, but also what the European Commission is doing more in detail. Mari, are you muted? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mariela, uh, for your nice um, introduction. Um, good morning to those on the other side of the Atlantic. Good afternoon to those who are watching this session from Europe and Africa. I'm delighted to be with you all and, of course, willing to learn from our distinguished panelists. 
since um, we are finalizing today with the um, cycle of um, online seminars on how to connect public and private responses to COVID-19 and underpin global development. I would like to congratulate ECDPM and I for this initiative and for facilitating a space for exchanges and reflection in these critical times. We certainly need to join forces and break the silence that sometimes separate governments from the private sector, the academia and civil um, society. Just during my uh, intervention, for clarity's um, sake, I would like to refer to three main aspects. First, the magnitude of the pandemic and its repercussions. We are seeing on the screen now this uh, very famous dashboard produced by the Johns Hopkins uh, University. I would like second to um, reflect on the immediate global response and particularly the response of the EU. And uh, I would like to conclude with a third um, uh, point on the opportunities that lie ahead of us. So on, on the magnitude of the, of the pandemic, since the end of Last year, the European Commission has been monitoring closely the evolution of COVID-19. We honestly reacted timely. However, looking back in retrospect, it was really difficult at that time to anticipate that by July 2020, the world would have over, one, um, over 11 million confirmed um, cases. On the one hand, the pandemic has revealed that even the most advanced health systems are not resilient enough. Under resource surveillance platforms, we're unable to promptly detect community spread until virus, viral circulation was uh, already widespread. Most countries have received a low score in the Global Health Security Index. This is an index um, that assess, assesses uh, health security and related capabilities in 195 countries. It was produced also by the Johns Hopkins University to get together with um, the Economist Intelligence Unit and the Nuclear Threat um, Initiative. On the other hand, for countries that already had very weak health systems and less resources, the impact of COVID-19 can be long-lasting. COVID-19 may affect countries' journey to universal health coverage and SDG3. While it is not possible to know the true death toll of COVID-19 due to underreporting, it is clear that in some countries, daily deaths have reached rates 50% of higher than the historical average. In Sub-Saharan Africa, a large number of people are at higher risk of infection due to preconditions, for example, HIV or tuberculosis. Simultaneous epidemics are also overwhelming public health systems in countries like Honduras, suffering from dengue, or uh, DRC, still suffering from um, Ebola. And also, finally, the, the, the provision of health of essential health services is at risk. So this is the, the landscape um, ahead of us. So what's the immediate uh, response? We can go to the, to the next uh, slide, please. The immediate response um, has tackled the emergency situation and it has adopted a multidimensional approach. In line with the multilateral efforts, the European Union and uh, our member states, through a joint Team Europe approach, uh, mobilized over 36 billion for low and middle income countries and for vulnerable populations. Populations. This has, this has been mostly the result of 
um, the re reorientation uh, reorientation of um, existing programs. All this is happening in the current uh, multi-annual financial cycle, which concludes this year. Um, and uh, at the same time, the uh, Commission launched a very successful coronavirus global response um, conference that uh, managed to mobilize almost uh, 9 billion in the month of May. And um, uh, lately, it has already reached um, around 16 uh, billion. So now my, my third point could be on what comes, what comes next, what comes under the next um, MFF. And then in the next MFF, it would be important to recall that the European Union has made a strong commitment towards human development. In uh, the European Consensus on Development, there is um, a target of at least 20% of EU ODA for human development and social protection. This is an opportunity to keep investing in health systems. Um, at the same time, the next uh, MFF opens the opportunity to embrace human development as the foundations of our priorities. One of them, digitalization. Um, Bobby Jefferson will, will talk more about this uh, subject. Another important uh, dimension to find joint solutions is the collaboration with the, with the private sector. We have had a first um, uh, initiative, the African Health Diagnostics Platform, a collaboration with the Gates Foundation and the European Investment Bank. Our colleague uh, Pauline, Pauline in, in, um, in Nigeria could also uh, give us uh, some insights about how this platform is being rolled out in, in Nigeria. And um, in a nutshell, um, we believe that this is the right moment to invest in health systems. Uh, investing in health systems is a smart investment because health systems are the prelude for social and economic stability and prosperity. I will stop here and maybe we'll come back. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. We can touch uh, and go more in detail uh, on some of the points you raised also in the Q&A session. Um, I'm going to give the floor to Bobby Jefferson. He is the Chief Technology Officer of DAI Global Health. Um, and Bobby, I think you will talk about technology and digital is a hot topic of today. Um, and we have listened to Martin, we have to invest more in health systems. But how do we organize responses? How do we know where we put our resources and where we have to act? And I think your experience in working with data, for example, is particularly relevant uh, on, on this and on tracking um, the COVID impact. So I give the floor to you. Uh, please uh, tell us more. Great, so thank you very much for allowing me to share. I'm Bobby Jefferson, uh, Chief Technology Officer at DAI Global Health. And we want to share just a little bit about health system strengthening experience, especially for health information systems, which is one of the building blocks, WHO building blocks. So if you can go to the next slide, please. What we find is there's a lot of dashboards and data. And so we've been able to on the and our projects and programs been able to help public health leaders ministries of health to have lots of information lots of, of of data and we know that this is important because they have to make critical decisions about resources about programs around you know the pandemic itself and so we built a dashboard similar to what many people have seen uh this one is called carte sanitaire um, for the ministry, this is for the Ministry of Health in Haiti. And, you know, what we found to be important is to have all this information and data and that's real time, up to date and available. But when it comes, but when it comes to health system strengthening, the question becomes, 
all these data, these dashboards, these systems, how are they sustained? After the pandemic, after the ministries move on to the next issue, how are these con- uh, information sources and data collection sources sustained? So next slide, please. So th- what we try to talk about is not just data, but people at the community level. So the data collection that has to happen, um, you know, all those red dots and all, are real people behind them. So in Haiti, those people are represented by people you know, people on the ground in the community that are going to work, that are not social distancing, that are that are going about their, their lives. So the question becomes, how do you collect information that's useful for the ministries of health in, in, the, in, in countries when the people often don't have smartphones, they still have a mobile phone, or increasingly that they're a, a mobile population or they're not adhering to uh, the guidelines, some of them do not have any IDs and biometrics and, and, and all these type of things. So we know that there's an urgent need that the ministries across the countries have asked around supporting, you know, contact tracing, for example. So, but how do you do contact tracing and tracking and providing reports of data when uh, people themselves may not even disclose that or want to disclose that they are feeling sick or that they are COVID, you know, presumptive positive? So the, the, these are some of the challenges. The, the additional challenge is whatever solution, how do you ensure that the ministries can own it, use it, and adopt it far after the pandemic threat is gone from this year and the next year and the next year after that? So how do you build resilience? Next slide, please. So in uh, our program, you know, in Haiti, we've designed a national health information system based on DHIS2, so the District Health Information Software version 2. And this software is endorsed by WHO, Gates, the EU, and many, and over 60 ministries of health. And so we use that as the platform for data collection around HIV data, TB data, malaria. So for HIV, uh, it was really important is to track patients who are lost to follow up, the ones who aren't taking their drugs or meds and being able to determine where they are. So we have used uh, DHS2 to track lost to follow up patients in the community. So we have people in the community supporting them. On the TB side, we have people who are trying to determine have TB patients finished their course of treatment. And so again, we've designed a TB tracker to allow the community level to engage at the community. So we've, done, we've created trust um, of being able to collect information, report information, because we have already have been doing this with other diseases, HIV, TB, and then immunization, uh, immunization techniques. Uh, so next slide, please. So what, what I'm advocating for and what we've done in, in Haiti and in other countries now is building the data collection reporting tools based on solutions that the ministries of health already have in hand. You know, this is a, it's an open source platform. Uh, it allows uh, patients to be screened and data collected at the ports, allows the contact tracking and tracing. But more importantly, the information and data that's collected, it's based on standards. It's based on the ministries of health and uh, ability to uh, and capacity to collect information and their ability to absorb the information that they're collecting as well so that they can determine the quality of the COVID uh, data that's coming into them. They can determine um, the information and the data that's being collected from the different um, uh, health facilities uh, all into a, a, single, a single platform. Why this is important because this allows uh, you know, the ministries now to have a resilient solution based on uh, the information that they know, that they need, and that they're familiar with. So a lot of the dashboards, a lot of the information, um, both Gates Foundation, the EU, have already d- done training in DHS2 to, to ministries of health uh, as well. So what I encourage is the private sector, as they offer private sector contact tracking, tracking and tracing systems, to be compatible with uh, DHS2. Next slide. Why is this important? Because when we talk about uh, health systems resiliency and, and, and for the future, we have lessons from Ebola. And so, you know, one of those, a few of those lessons were like during the Ebola crisis, 
Um, there were over 50 to 60 different mobile applications that were developed, and the ministries couldn't support many of them at all. And so we knew that that was a, a, a challenge, so that was a, a, a very strong lesson. Is So the private sector is going to develop many apps. And so you, know, you can go to Google Play Store, or you can go to App, uh, uh, App, Apple Store, and, there, and they have many contact tra tracking and tracing. What we're recommending is that the ministries in the private sector have the data uh, from these applications that, that can interoperate or send or connect to DHS2. So that way the ministries can then have access to the information. Another lesson learned is around uh, standards and, and some of those things. So we know that uh, if, you, if you're collecting information in, in a way that can't be shared, then you're creating these islands and, uh, of data collection islands for that don't offer the ministry an ability to consume and use and, uh, the information. The, the other lesson from, from Ebola that we've applied to, to the COVID solution we're doing in Haiti is that uh, data sharing agreements. So you're collecting information, so these contact tracking apps, but you, you, know, you should have the data sharing agreements in place so that the health facilities and others know information, the patients know the information that's being collected. So I just wanted to share a few lessons that we have done in uh, our COVID tracking system that really responds to how to make the solutions much more, the technology solutions much more resilient for the health. So thank you very much. And I open for questions as well. Yes, indeed, that's what you're going to do now. Um, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A box on the right hand of your screen. Uh, but uh, while we wait for uh, questions from the floor, I think people are still digesting what you have told them. Um, I have actually some questions for for you as well. Thank you so much for the presentation. And Bobby, you touched on a very important point to me, which is the trust. You know, how do we create trust? We have seen in this pandemic, probably as never before, a massive amount of data circulating and you know updates and the John Hopkins universities role in this, um, but also um, somehow battles against uh, you know, misinformation um, made on purpose or not. So in your experience, how do you create trust in data? How do you bring data to release information about themselves and then the trust necessary to use this data for decision making? Um, let's start with this and then I have other questions in case. Okay. So on the issue of trust, I, uh, my colleague, Krista Batista, uh, at uh, the session last week also mentioned that we did a publication around uh, data privacy and, and trust. So, I, I, you know, I'll share a link um, about that. One of the ways to address uh, trust that we've seen is as uh, we have established uh, other community health tracking systems. So where we're collecting uh, the community health workers and the health facilities are collecting information um, from patients, uh, for example, around immunization, um, for example, for, for TB. And so in, in our program, we've established trust because the community has seen us already, um, you know, with their information, collecting information, and, and helping support them. So establishing trust at the community level um, is important. And what, one way that is, is to do that is to working through the community health workers themselves. Uh, because uh, yes, you're collecting this information on a mobile phone, and 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 applications are collecting information um, all about you. But what you, what patients, you know, individuals care about is what are you going to do with the information you're collecting, and do you have my informed consent uh, to do that? And so one of the trusted uh, institutions, of course, is is the health, is the clinics, is the nurses, is the doctors. So we've. Um, enrolled and, and empowered uh, the community to really trust in that the information is only being shared within the ministries of, of health um, type of systems. W once you, you know, go beyond um, uh, the ministries of health, then, you, you know, I, you need to have what I call data sharing agreements. Um, these agreements, you know, allow, hey, I'm collecting information what, how, am I going to sell it? Am I going to reuse it? You know, this informed consent process, many, many of the uh, applications and solutions are bypassing this step. 
and 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 not being uh, trustworthy about the data usage at all. So we're trying to use uh, community health workers and people that are trusted in the community to establish that that means of trust. Very um, very interesting. Let me check if you have some questions from the floor. Okay. Um, you can also ask questions to yourself. Uh, yeah. panelists. Sorry. Oh, yes, we have um, a question for you, primarily for Bobby again. Uh, other than trust from stakeholders, what were the bigger technical hurdles to overcome in, in obtaining and sharing data, Bobby? So the biggest uh, technical hurdles the, 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 is actually uh, trying to understand um, what is it that you want to collect around uh, COVID? Is it the patient themselves? Is it their proximity? Is it th that where their location is? Uh, so it's you know being able to say okay the type of information that uh, you that you want to collect and having the the both the community and the ministries on board with that because you, you know oftentimes people collect everything and not and then decide later what they want to do with it. So what we found to be important was was uh, just really analyzing what is it that we minimum information we need to collect and what we what, what the Ministry of Health was going to do with the information once they collected it. Um, so if you collect someone's phone numbers, if you collect uh, personally identifiable information, um, what, what are you going to do with it? The, the tech, second technical hurdle then became um, not just uh, how to transfer that information, but, but what do you do with the information so that way the policymakers can make decisions based on the data. And as you know, that's very hard right now in this environment. Many of the, the leaders, public health leaders, uh, want to make decisions based on evidence and data. Many of the permanent secretaries and the politicians want to make decisions based on politics rather than data. And so it becomes a, a challenge when the data that you're collecting is, is also, uh, you, you know, not being supported by the the ones at the top who 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 want to you know keep the economy going and keep you know opening up uh, the economy, but the data doesn't suggest that we're that, that you know you're, you're there yet. And so one of the challenges actually is trying to be very truthful about what the data speaks and what the interpretation of that data means, so they can make decisions, but not you know allowing the just the politics to make the decisions uh, around the data. So that was, that's really been the technical challenge is people don't want to know how many died in, 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 uh, in, 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 the, in one of the areas. People don't want to see that the trend is increasing, uh, you know, at the political level. But that's what the data, you know, is suggesting and, and, and saying. So th that's the challenge is the, uh, the data use, the decision making at the policy level, say, you know, trying to support that. Great. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, David Paul, for your question. I think we can um, maybe go on with the other speakers and also get questions later um, and comments from Mar on other aspects um, as well. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Vinny Caboyo. He is the country director for um, the project called Tackling Deadly, uh, country coordinator for the defeat funded Tackling Direct deadly diseases in Africa program. Um, in the main aim of this is about strengthening capacities to address pandemics in multiple actors, uh, with, uh, working with multiple actors. This is what Winnie is going to talk us, uh, to us about. Um, we are jumping into, I would say, the big topic of beyond the pandemic now, how do we strengthen health systems uh, going forward? And I think that Dr. Winnie will have uh, a lot to share with us about this. So, Vini, the floor is yours. And we are all very shy today. Vini, you are, mute up. You are unmuted now. Now we can hear you, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Mariela, and welcome uh, to the webinar, all of you. Uh, my name is Vini Caboyo. I'm a a veterinarian by training, but also a public health 
our expert has worked both in the Ministry of Agriculture in Uganda and also in the Ministry of Health, also in Uganda. So I've been very much in the zoonosis area and one health uh, approach. Um, we are trying to strengthen systems, health systems, beyond the COVID and the, for the future. What is the way forward? I'll go on about three um, key issues. One of them is if you want to develop a strong system, health system or any other system, you must have good policies, uh, you must have good plans, you must have appropriate standard operating procedures, you must have a good guidelines, and it's not only having them, but also understanding them and also implementing them. So what we have done in Uganda and also in the neighboring countries where we share experiences, we have joined the world, we have joined the international community to make sure that we strengthen and participate in the international regulation, the global security agenda, and also uh, subscribe to the WHO Integrated Surveillance and Response um, guidelines to make sure that all the public health events are well understood and we have got good policies and good plans to address them. And this has been the case even before COVID and uh, this has been now maybe even more urgent and more imperative with this outbreak. So as an example, we have had the uh, number of policies, a number of response plans for the various uh, outbreaks Uganda has had. And uh, as we as did up now, we are helping the, the government to push through the National Action Plan for Health Security. We developed a plan, and uh, this plan is going to be is being implemented, and specifically the TDAP uh, program is helping to develop monitoring and evaluation plan. Afterwards, we shall also um, make sure that we have, we support after action reviews, we support simulation exercises, working together with our multi partners, the RTSA Resolve to Save Lives. Uh, we have been working with them in this uh, national action plan, WHO Centers for Disease Control, and we also have the Public Health Emergency Operation Center and the National Health Platform. Of course, in this uh, um, uh, endeavor, we meet challenges. Uh, some of the key challenges are that uh, the guidelines which we have, within the national guidelines, the WHO guidelines, sometimes are not followed. Like I said earlier, we need to have them, but also implement them. Uh, even within the African community, uh, which Uganda is, is one of the regional bodies with a strong health um, system. Each country, unfortunately, is, wa is not. Each country is working separately. Not we are not working together uh, in this COVID response. So these are some of the challenges. You may have the guidelines, you may have the protocols, but when it comes to actual implementation, at the time when you need to come together you find that because of other reasons, like political inclinations, um, security concerns, and differences in, in, in an approach by different countries, we don't implement these uh, guidelines. And this has been very evident in the COVID response. Uh, some countries have had strict lockdowns. Some countries, our neighboring countries, have not had uh, so much of strict lockdowns. There's free movement of people. Even when you do the screening at the points of entry, so there's that mismatch. That's one of the challenges. I think the solution here would be to uh, bring the political players with the scientists and the, enhance the collaboration that is required both at international and regional levels. Let's harmonize our policies. Let us harmonize our interventions. Let us share across uh, borders and across uh, the different uh, uh, sectors, uh, both in the, in the, within the country and also outside. For example, uh, during the Ebola outbreak in the DRC, 
Uh, Uganda has been monitoring and working together in close collaboration with the DRC government to respond to the Ebola virus disease. Unfortunately, the disease never crossed into Uganda because we are very closely working with our neighbor, uh, the DRC. Um, the second uh, level of improving systems, especially during this time when we know that uh, most of the emerging and re-emerging diseases are zoonotic in nature. They are diseases of animals primarily, which uh, because of uh, genetic changes uh, become adaptable to humans. So there are multiple actors we must work with. Different governments, NGOs, United Nations agencies, and academia, they have all joined together especially in Uganda under the National Health Platform. So TDAP as a program is supporting the platform, supporting the One Health Second Working Groups. And uh, this year we see this as very useful because it brings in expertise and it's a very big opportunity. We get experiences and we are sharing resources uh, where possible. Of course, there are also challenges. Like I said, in every system you find there are different um, the resource levels in the different sectors, sometimes mandates do not match each other and you find people still acting uh, in unison in a vertical system instead of working together as a one health, uh, in a one health platform. I would suggest that uh, to, as a solution, let us value these uh, platforms, let us harmonize uh, our resources, special availability of funds, availability of training opportunities, and also encourage professional exchanges and working together so that uh, we promote uh, this uh, One Health. Then thirdly, can we go to the next slide, please? The next slide. Uh, TDAP is also supporting surveillance. As you know, uh, to build a health system, you must have good surveillance system. So we are supporting the government to do data quality, timeliness, completeness, uh, working through electronic platforms so that data is easily uh, <coughs> analyzed and it is made available in real time. The challenges, of course, are infrastructural challenges, internet, especially in rural areas, it's not easily available, it's not consistent. Uh, the need for training. And we, like in Uganda, yeah, we have so many um, intercurrent epidemics at the same time. Like right now, there's a cholera outbreak, there's a yellow fever outbreak, uh, anthrax, and all these. So these also impact on how well you can concentrate on one uh, outbreak when you have many others which are surrounding you. But it's also an opportunity where you have already got uh, people with experience, people who are already used to these dangerous diseases and know how to protect themselves and are therefore not um, afraid to go in and start uh, doing the, uh, the contact tracing and the case management and the rest. Specifically for TDAP, what are we doing? TDAP, uh, we are not only focusing on COVID, and I'm sure, as you all know, the program started before the outbreak of COVID, so we are supporting government to focus on other diseases, like I said, uh, those which are of public health importance. So we are supporting technically, uh, attending the National Task Force meetings, attending partners' meetings, and supporting in quarantine and risk communication to make sure that the government is responding properly and appropriately to the COVID outbreak. I think with that uh, brief, let me stop here and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and we are going to have our final speaker. Um, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Polam Basinga is the Gates Foundation Country Director for Nigeria. Um, I think Polan, you will 
we will have spoken about, especially Vini, but also the other speakers about the, um, you know, the global, uh, the, hack, the responses to COVID and also global health. And I think uh, you will talk to us about the role of the Gates Foundation in uh, in this. And um, you know, I am particularly interested, as you know, in how this. Um, actually focusing also on strengthening global system health forward, going forward beyond and which is the topic of today um, and also how we address the crisis but I'm sure you have a lot to say about this so we are with our ears all open. Thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Wonderful, uh, thank you very very much um, I'm Mariana for having me. I would just like to first Start by thanking uh, the EC uh, DPM and DRI for organizing uh, this, this platform for us to share knowledge. And also uh, to really thank the other panelists uh, who started before me. I've been taking a lot of notes and learning a lot about what um, other people are doing. So I'm Paulin Basinga, as I was introduced. I'm Ian Abuja, I lead the Gate Foundation work here, but also I'm uh, working very closely with our regional director, Umar Sebi, who's based in South Africa, who leads our Gate Foundation operation across Africa. But also collectively, we're working uh, very closely with our <coughs> global team, uh, you know, back in Seattle and um, also other offices, given that, uh, um, you know, Need to collectively respond to a global cooperation around uh, you know this outbreak has been also instrumental. Just wanted to show two slides very quickly because I'll anchor my my my, my talk on this slide. So this is something that we are we've been calling uh, you know the triangle of trade uh, you know trade off decisions. As you can see on the top there is the COVID response itself. Uh, many governments around the world have been really. Uh, you know, managing the threat of decision around these three things. First of all, you know, putting in place a COVID response. Uh, many countries in Africa have created a presidential task force or multi-sectorial task force to uh, really, you know, uh, you know, put in place, you know, strategy to, you know, test and treat and and, and prevent, you know, against, uh, you know, this pandemic. And then the second one is uh, economic pressure. You know, uh, the lockdown uh, that many government put in place have created you know, uh, important fiscal pressure, important economic pressure. Uh, and then the third one is, um, you know, maintaining routine health services. You know, as you all know, especially in poor setting countries, you know, given COVID, given lockdown, given the, you know, fact that, um, you know, government, you know, took some time, you know, to organize themselves, you know, order PPEs, et cetera, to distribute them, you know, across all prime healthcare facilities in even rural areas. You know, back in March, April, et cetera, we've seen a drastic decrease of, you know, use of services. You know, all modeling that, uh, you know, many academicians have been doing have shown that on the continent, especially here in Africa, the bulk of morbidity and mortality, you know, will come or is already coming from, you know, uh, you know increasing, uh, you know, preventable diseases and malaria and, and, and other maternal newborn health uh, issues. So, it's really important as we talk uh, about the need to continue building a robust uh, health system, uh, because uh, the more uh, strong, you know, a stronger system, when you have a stronger system in place, which is capitalizing on the knowledge that we have, you know, in West Africa, in East Africa, and I think my co colleague Wayne from Uganda mentioned that, the fact that they've been able to really talk, work very closely with DRC, you know, African countries have developed that muscle, that capacity to really you know, uh, detect and, 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 and contain the outbreak very quickly. So that uh, capacity of, you know, good preparedness combined with a very strong health system, which is well funded, which is resourced, which is, you know, strengthened, I think we'll be able to, uh, to, to move uh, very quickly. And the second slide, if uh, uh, I may, if you can just go to the second slide, I just wanted to show, um, you know, one thing that um, uh, also, you know, Bobby talked a lot about, you know, which is, they need to have, you know, uh, government systems that are strong and that are resilient, that you are able to really use to change. So this is uh, data that I just pulled from uh, the Federal Ministry of uh, Health in Nigeria, and this is their DHIS2 tool uh, that Bobby was talked about. You know, they've been able to pull the data from all 30, uh, you know, six plus one states in Nigeria, 
it's uh, more than 30,000 um, you know, facilities that report to the DHIS2 and then come to the federal level, and they are able to centralize that data into a platform which is now open source. And you can see the blue line is their data from 2019. You know, they can track how many uh, you know, women were able to uh, you know, come for prenatal visits. They can track how many kids were vaccinated. They can track how many cases of clinical malaria they saw last year. So because they had that system institutionalized within the Federal Ministry of Health, because everyone is reporting to that one source, now they were able very quickly you know, to do an analysis and create a dashboard, which is helping them now you know, to look, to compare the same period of time from last year, 2019, to the uh, you know, time now. You can see that from January to March, you know, it was you know, kind of like the same kind of like pattern that was happening at the facility. And then when COVID hit in February, March, you can see the use of services declining. And this is only human. And if this crisis continues, if we're not able to pull that, you know, orange bar up, you know, we will be uh, really, you know, a challenge. It should be an important challenge to, you know, uh, maintaining service. So this is the need to have a strong you know, system uh, which is in place. Now, I know we have, uh, you know, uh, not enough time, but let me pivot a little bit by saying what the Gate Foundation is doing, you know, globally. So we've been, um, you know, very um, uh, early on in the epidemic. You know, we initially committed 10 million to the response. You know, in January 26, as the Gates Foundation, and then we realized that it was very important for us to come in very quickly. We uh, added a commitment of 100 million dollar uh, when it became clear that resources were really needed. And then later on, we added additional financing. So now we, you know, uh, had close to 300 million dollar committed globally, uh, and the, the, the money is being used, uh, you know, basically through, three, you know, two things. One is, you know, funding, you know, research and development, you know, around, you know, testing, you know, treatment and vaccine. You know, on testing, we really need to, you know, uh, make sure that we have public health services and tools that are available, especially in poor setting countries, in developing countries, so that they are able to detect cases and, and track the cases. In terms of treatment, uh, we've worked with uh, you know, many other donors like the Wellcome Trust to identify and develop new therapeutics that are safe, uh, that are quick uh, you know, to manufacture, but also that can be delivered in uh, poor setting countries. And then third is to prevent. You know, we all know that we will go back to you know, a new normal uh, when we are able to have a vaccine. So being able to really pull the global cooperation, uh, a coalition building, and then driving innovation to really accelerate, uh, you know, your, you know, uh, the development of a new vaccine uh, that is safe and that is also able to, uh, you know, uh, be deployed uh, equitably, you know, to all uh, people was very, very important. And this is why in 2017, fortunately, the Gates Foundation, you know, in partnership with, uh, you know, other donors, uh, created SETI, you know, which is the Coalition for Epidemic and Preparedness Innovation, and then. Um, you know, that step has been uh, really, you know, uh, you know, put in place very quickly, you know, to be able to, um, you know, manage uh, the uh, implementation of uh, all those research. And then uh, with the uh, European Commission, you know, joining us, including other donors like Japan, Ethiopia, and others, we've been able to really, uh, you know, uh, put in place structures that can dramatically reduce the time it takes to develop new vaccines. You know, I think those vaccines, as soon as they are developed, and with partnership with WHO and other donors and UNICEF and others, we'll be able to really work in partnership with governments here in Africa to prepare them to make sure that those vaccines and new tools will go through, uh, you know, the clinical trials and through the, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, approaches that are needed to make sure that they are accepted at the country level. But at the same time, helping countries now responding to the pandemic, you know, making sure that they have the structures in place. You know, to uh, you know, uh, you know, take on those new tools would be very instrumental. So I'll stop here and uh, happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Yes, well, and thank you, uh, thank you to you, um, and thank you for the very insightful uh, conversation so far for from all the the speakers. Um, we open the floor for questions. I see one here. I received another one privately, uh, which and I will start with that. Uh, Ma, are you there? Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I, will, yeah. I will start my video again. Hi. <laughs> That's fine. Um, 
Uh, there is a, a question uh, for you, uh, which is, is related to the collaboration with you, which is how can the private sector engage with you on health uh, more going forward and in, in practical uh, terms? Um, Thank you for the question. This is this is uh, the the one million one million dollar um, question. Um, there, there are different avenues for this um, collaboration. The um, the the next um, multiannual financial uh, framework um, and and the new um, NDK um, will uh, probably have. Um, a, str a stronger um, support from from EU delegations. So so we tend to advise um, companies, entrepreneurs, to reach out to to the delegations. There are several uh, platforms to engage in in multi-actor um, dialogue. Um, I also referred earlier to the EU external investment plan, which uh, facilitated for the time being the African Health Diagnostics Platform, which is an initiative that um, tries to facilitate uh, access to diagnostics for um, the, the, the poorest populations in Sub-Saharan um, Africa. And uh, of course, uh, what is very important for for the Commission is that our partnerships with the with the private sector uh, respect our policies and our principles. This means um, whatever we do needs to be in an integrated way, respecting the preferences of our partner countries and ensuring ultimately universal health uh, coverage, or at least contributing to universal health coverage. And um, yeah, Mark, a following up question on this actually for me, do you see health as a more of a priority than in the past in you know, the next uh, programming of, of your resources? Do you think that COVID Will somehow bring health more to the fore um, in uh, in your conversations with partner countries, or do you envision that things in the end will not change very much? Because I'm speaking with some some country representatives, and they say yes, health is very important; it's extremely essential for us. But then, on the other hand, we are now very concerned on the economic and socioeconomic impact on COVID as well. So we need to balance. In the end, what sort of requests we do to our international partners as well. Uh, and then um, I'll take the opportunity to pick a question from the floor from Andrew McKenzie, um, which uh, is around um, the technology. DHIS has validation rules, and this would have been flagged. So this is a question for uh, the floor, probably Bobby or Vinny or, yeah, you go. And then we go on with the conversation. So on your question about um, um, health in the in the future, it's true that we might have the impression that uh, the Commission and the international community is already uh, supporting strongly um, healthcare uh, because we announced uh, tremendous uh, volumes of uh, financial aid. However, at least this year. Um, the, the majority of our support has to do with the emergency response. So it has to do more with the provision of uh, uh, personal protective equipment, um, the delivery of um, um, other health um, commodities. So this means that the, the, the message about the importance of strengthening health systems and all uh, the, the the building blocks, including including um, information, um, still needs to be uh, a bit more uh, robust and uh, better received by by delegations. It's true that delegations also sometimes follow a certain inertia in the sense that um, 
they have a tradition of partnering with um, governments in certain areas. So governments already expect expect our delegations to keep working in 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 these areas. But in any case, I think the crisis has been a wake up call for all. And um, right now, it's in the hands of the delegations to identify um, the the most uh, suitable uh, programs for our our partner countries. It's important. It's important also to to recall that uh, the Commission is not uh, uh, isolated. There are many other international partners and donors working in this um, space. So I would say that uh, investments in 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 healthcare and the support of the international community to health systems should naturally increase. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a social imperative, and as I said earlier, it's also a smart um, investment. However, that doesn't mean that everything should be uh, healthcare. Um, there are also concerns about um, the, the social and economic um, implications of of the of the crisis, and we will continue supporting also um, other areas beyond beyond health. Thank you very much. I have a question from uh, Rafael Aipo uh, for all of you, um, and he says it's true uh, you all talked about capacity building throughout the health system, but I'm surprised that no one has talked about capacity building in the information sector. So my question is for you, what place has communication and information in the health system? And anyone wants to pick up on this question? So yes. hi, this is Bobby. Oh, Bobby, you can go. Yeah, I can just start and then uh, I'll, I'll address two questions at the same time. So mm -hmm. uh, the capacity building in the in the uh, around information and Andrew's question around the DHS2 and data quality. So mm -hmm. the, the specific example um, that I've experienced is where uh, the data sharing occurs, where some uh, private sector or others are at a clinic or hospital, they're using a mobile app or you know, they're collecting information, HIV, TB, COVID. And now they want to share the information they collected with the ministry, so into the DHS2 system. And so we've had the case where people are collecting HIV information and they sent us pregnant males. And it wasn't the DHS2 side, our side, because we have very good data quality, very good data validation checks. But the issue is, we, you know, you, you can't control on the private sector side or on the data collection side how well their validation rules are. So the question always is, um, if you're going to share information and data, uh, how can you ensure that someone is sharing with you high quality information? And if you reject it because you don't want pregnant males in your system, or if you don't want, you know, uh, a low number of COVID cases because it's not true, uh, how do you then build their capacity to, you know, have improved data quality, have improved um, DQA before they send uh, this information? So, you know, we've tried to use systems and solutions that. Um, are based on um, either DHS2 or a WHO-sponsored solutions such that you, you can build the capacity at the same time. So th that's why we're, we're really you know, stressing the importance of having the private sector and others join the, the data standards working groups and join, the, because that's where the Ministry of Health, that's where we're building the capacity uh, the information capacity of the ministries to talk about data quality, data uh, assurance, uh, that type of thing, for when you're trying to do, uh, you know, for, for the data uh, data sharing. So that's been the, the real practical issue for us is mm -hmm. how to prevent poor data quality uh, in the data sharing. Okay. okay. Um, does anyone want to come back on this, otherwise we go to the... Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing, Mariela, if I may. Go. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, Rafael Iapo is, you know, asking a very, very important point here, given that, you know, we've seen it during uh, COVID response, right? It, uh, uh, you know, fact that many people have access to the data, but the way they use the data to really provide information that 
you know, talk to the people, talk to the people at the community level, at the grassroots level, very, very important. You know, how do we work very closely with journalists so that when they report information, the information is fact-based and also it's using evidence-based data, but in a way that uh, really is appealing to the people that they are informing. Like people, you know, uh, there are many, many information that are being shared through WhatsApp groups, uh, through Facebook, etc. So how can we, as the you know, public health community, really provide information in a way that is easily digestible for them to understand so that they can share you know, fact-based information? So I think that is a very good point. I don't have a clear answer. In Nigeria, we've been you know, working with uh, you know, local uh, you know, uh, NGOs to really help them with you know, strategic information as they're supporting like the presidential task force or they're supporting states, et cetera to make sure that they take the information, they translate the information into local context so that people can really understand what is going on with the, the pandemic. Great. And, um, well, and as we are with you, there is a question from, from, for you from, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce it correctly, uh, Sanyo Nayak, uh, who is asking, South Africa has um, 196,750 um, COVID-19 cases so far, and around 3,000 uh, 3, fatalities. So this is quite high as compared to any other Sub-Saharan Africa country. And I would like to understand the reason uh, from you. Thanks. And then, Polan, when you're done, uh, Vini, maybe you can come in. Um, I have one question a bit around um, you touched about learning from Ebola, and uh, so I was wondering, uh, what are the lessons that you retain from past pandemics that you are using in, in your work today? I think maybe Polan can go first, and then we go to Vili. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, this uh, question from Samuel is an important one. It's true that uh, you know, South Africa you know, was hit uh, the, you know, among the first countries on, on the continent, and and their cases are, will continue to, 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 to increase. And there's a combination of uh, many things here. I'm not an expert in South Africa. I think it would be really good you know, to you know, uh, get some you know, straight answers from you know, people who are following the pandemic there very closely. Uh, but as we track the pandemic across the continent, you see South Africa, you know, uh, Nigeria, and then Ghana really leading in terms of number of you know, cases and, and then also number of you know, fatalities. And most of the cases in South Africa are coming from a specific, you know, area there. Probably the combination of capacity to test, to detect very quickly. Also a combination of, um, you know, uh, you know uh, how many people are living in one, you know, space, et cetera. So I don't, you know, it's very difficult for now to, you know, really generalize, uh, you know, in comparison to other countries. One thing that we've learned from this pandemic is that it's really, you know, uh, you know showing up differently in different continents, and even within uh, African countries, the pandemic has different faces, and even within a country, you know, the pandemic has different faces within the same country. Like in Nigeria as well, there are, you know, more than, you know, uh, you know, seven, you know, 800 uh, local governments, you know, LGAs, but there are like 20 LGAs where more than 80% of all cases are concentrated. So. Still unknown, uh, but I'll be, you know, happy to do some additional research, uh, you know, checking with my South African, uh, you know, colleagues to understand exactly, you know, what is happening. But we're still learning a lot uh, from this pandemic. Thank you, Polan. Um, Hello. Yes. Now uh, on the Ebola experience, I think you know that Uganda was the, among the. Um, African countries which has had over like maybe eight or so Ebola, separate Ebola outbreaks since the first outbreak in the year 2000. Uh, then we had another one, 2004, you know, we have been having. So this has served us very well, this experience. And when it came to COVID, we already had the structures uh, that were geared towards uh, responding to these outbreaks. As I said, we have been uh, doing surveillance, uh, we have been doing border control along the DRC Uganda border to stop the 2018 border outbreak in DRC from filtering into the country. So already there were teams stationed 
at the points of entry like on the western uh, on the western border of, of, of Uganda. So these screening teams were quickly turned into screening for COVID. Uh, they were taking temperature, they were checking uh, symptoms, so it was not very difficult to switch over even at the international airport and other points of entry from Ebola to screening now for the COVID. Uh, secondly, we have also had the uh, trained people to do surveillance, to do contact tracing, to do follow-ups, isolation, um, putting on don doffing and donning on PPEs. So all these um, terms were actually already familiar with our health workers. They were already familiar with the people, um, the, with the communities. So the, the, it needed just a little bit of tweaking um, for us to to change quickly from Ebola to uh, to COVID. Uh, the National Task Force started um, responding to COVID even before we had the, the first case. So we're already planning using the Ebola National Task Force. We added another agenda now for COVID. So it was the same team, the same partners, the same NGOs, uh, who were quickly mobilized because they were already working with Ebola response teams. Things like barrier teams, they were already trained for Ebola. So it was the, it was really like switching them over to something different but similar in the way it was supposed to be handled. So I think we it was the, an experience which has served us well. And the, like I said, now Uganda have confirmed 900 and almost the 927 cases, confirmed cases, but luckily we have not had any deaths from, from COVID. And over 700 have, have, have been discharged. So I think we're handling it well, but I can assure you the experience of the main outbreaks, the ball inclusive have been uh, very well, um, uh, have helped the country to respond to COVID-19. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, we have time uh, for one minute each final comment. So this is your last chance to um, you know, give up your uh, points um, and then yeah, I will close. Um, so um, maybe Mark, do you want to start? Sure. Thank you very much. This, this has been a very informative um, conversation with you all. Um, if I had to pick one final message right now, I would maybe refer back to something that, that uh, Poland said. We are learning. And, uh, and I think this is a beautiful uh, lesson of the crisis. We should not take anything for granted. We need to keep learning and we need to keep improving the way um, we uh, the way we work together and another uh, important message from my side would be the importance of being accountable and responsible okay well thank you um i'll go in order maybe bobby you go yeah for me the important takeaway to share is that even when information and data is collected and the evidence is presented, mm -hmm. that the policymakers make decisions based on evidence and not based on politics. I mean, this, you know, because we, we have a lot of good information, we have great dashboards, we've got the ability to, to do surveillance, but if ultimately the decisions are made based on politics and not based on evidence, um, then this, you know, is, is, a, is a true challenge to continuing to have a, a strong health system if you ignore the evidence. So um, th that's the, you know, point that I'd like to, to, to leave. Yes, indeed. Vivini? Uh, thank you. My, I think my, my last comment is on uh, the observation which we have made by Seeing that international health regulations, international protocols, uh, even regional protocols on health, 
uh, when they are made during the peace time, when there is no big outbreak, when there is uh, everybody is relaxed, we get very many good uh, protocols made, mm -hmm. and the protocols which everybody has uh, endorsed and signed. But when the actual outbreak comes, countries tend to look um, inside. They tend to disregard these protocols. And uh, I think an example was many of the IHR um, regulations mm -hmm. were not observed. Countries, each country decided to do its own, uh, what they thought was good for, the, for their country at, at the time. So I think the flexibility is needed when these protocols are being made so that countries are given the, 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 the leeway to decide some of the things without them being seen as breaking international, um, international regulations and international protocols, which they had already endorsed. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Yeah, in Poland? Thank you very much. Um, I'll say three things quickly. I think the first one is um, really the, the, the need to continue building strong and resilient system. You know, we've seen, um, you know, in my, in my career, it's the first time that in the past four months, we talked a lot about health, the need for health, uh, you know, building strong systems. I'm sure, you know, in you know, all of your experience, you've seen how, you know, in the past week, in the past few months, when you needed any authority, you know, they've been able to jump on a call. Like health has been on top of the agenda. Because we've all seen when you don't have a very strong health system, this is what can happen, right? So this is one. And the second is, you know, we really need to um, leverage those systems that we have to respond to pandemic. There are countries that, just mm -hmm. a country like Rwanda, where they have 60,000 community health workers, they were able to use the community health worker as contact tracing very, very quickly. You know, countries that, you know, West Africa that, you know, knew exactly how to, you know, uh, drive, you know, using the experience with pandemic, et cetera, they've been able to, you know, uh, leverage those. And the last one I would say is that when we, you know, uh, you know, build system to respond to COVID, as a global community, we need to be very careful not to build a parallel system to the system that exists. Yeah. We really need to strengthen existing structures and systems so that we, we can be able to, rea you know, to respond to any other outbreak. You know, we can learn from you know, the, you know, how we responded to the HIV pandemic back in you know, 2000, et cetera. You know, I think from those lessons, we really need to use COVID as, you know, like, you know, let's not you know, let, you know, get the crisis to really using the resources and this momentum to build existing structures uh, so that we will be able, we'll be even better prepared for the uh, next pandemic. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for your thoughts and also to our participants for being with us uh, today. Um, my uh, takeaway is probably build structures that last in a way. You know? So we have in the opportunity here with the, it's probably not an opportunity in the sense that it's uh, definitely a crisis. So it's, in some countries we have seen dramatic scenes. Uh, I'm from Italy, so you can imagine. But um, you know, we have in front of us the way the opportunity to build structures that for health can deliver better health services for all going forward. Um, I've listened to you about the different impacts in different countries and so somehow adapt responses to the circumstances, the capacities and the needs of the countries and the communities we work with, um, but also the necessity to build the political momentum. So somehow uh, put, put health uh, on the agenda, um, considering all the variety of needs that exist, but keep health on the agenda as a basic need and um, a good investment for the future for everybody. So somehow I shared interest in this um, endeavor. Um, I will uh, conclude uh, on this. Thank you for all, uh, to all of you for participating. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed staying with us today. Bye-bye.